at a time when we're losing our oldest and most precious trees and forests from around the world. I'm curious to understand if and why this matters to all of us. Welcome to the Meaning of Trees podcast. I'm Tom Hill and it's here that I meet with people from all walks of life to explore the answers to one essential question. What do trees mean to you? Kevin Martin is head of tree collections at the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, and he's currently doing a research master's degree at the University of Lancashire, pushing the boundaries to the next level when it comes to climate change modelling for trees. Kev's global, tree habitat-centred work is helping Kew prepare for 2090 whilst he refines his innovative algorithms. Kev's passion for trees is totally infectious. Here I find out about where it all began with trees for him, what it was like to go to exotic locations to catch a glimpse of the future, and what he and his wife talk about on Valentine's Day. What a fascinating mind this guy has. Kev, welcome to the Meaning of Trees podcast. Thank you for inviting me. Thanks for popping along to speak to me. And before we go into the really innovative work that you're involved with around trees, I want to know on a basic level, what do trees mean to you? Oh, that's a deep question, isn't it? Trees, to be honest, they've been a part of my life ever since I was small. So they mean a lot to me. I love finding out how they grow, why they grow, and they're so important to everyone. And what I always find interesting, that trees mean lots of things to different people. You know, you get some people that see them as a, a, re a religious status, and you get some people that just admire them in landscapes. But then you get some people that are very passionate, and they will go and try and save any tree and that's what I've always find really interesting but for me it's been my livelihood I've been involved with trees ever since I left school and they do mean a lot that it, it, a lot of our family time is revolved around my work and what we do with trees and you know I'd like to try and introduce my children to the fascinating world of them and you know how a tree grows in the landscape is amazing you know, we've only got to look outside here and look at those London planes. You know, how are those London planes surviving in that environment? Because it's so unnatural, but yet they survive and they provide so many benefits to mankind. And, you know, we're very selfish. We just take them for a, we just take advantage of them. You know, they're providing lots of oxygen, air, and there's multiple ecosystem services, yet the general public never stand still to truly understand what's going on and that's yeah that's what i find really intriguing about them yeah like they're in plain sight but no one in their busy lives are, stops to notice them or very few people yeah i know and it's it, it's frustrating if people just stood for a couple of minutes and just wondered how and why you know we'd all have a lot more understanding and that's what i find really interesting especially when i talk to other people about my research and my work you know when you start talking oh that's really interesting but they don't ever think that until you introduce them to it and I just yeah I just find that an incredible thing really and a privilege really to manage the trees that I do at Q and it allows me to do the work that I do you know we're all very privileged to be able to try to understand more and how we can try to communicate that with the general public and I think things like this are amazing because it's starting to get that communication piece to the general public because a lot of them are blind to it and I think as tree professionals that's going to be one of the biggest roles we have as we move forward. Yeah it can bring such a richness to people's everyday lives if they if they do look into it and I'm curious to know for you where did that spark begin? So were there people in your life that helped to create that spark or nurture it? Or yeah, what are the earliest trees you have fond memories of? Yeah, so for me, I grew up with it. My dad was a tree surgeon. So I've been around trees and working with trees ooh, since the age of three. 
I suppose. Three or four, I used to go and watch Dad work on trees at the weekends when health and safety wasn't like it was today. But yeah, so I used to go and watch Dad. There's lots, there's photos of me at home and I can always remember Dad doing some work in someone's garden. I went there with my little lunchbox and I watched. And that's where the true passion come from was uh, going with Dad and watching Dad do the work. And then he would explain different things to do with trees, how they pruned them, you know, what you should be doing. You know, I remember one thing he showed us to start with was lightning strikes and the scar that it leaves and, you know, things like that. So, yeah, I, my whole career, really, I it's from my dad. You know, I just was obsessed with it. And I can remember, you know, in the garage at home, he had all his climbing kit and I was just fascinated by the climbing kit and the chainsaws. And when he was, like, fixing saws, because one had broken down, especially the old steel O2Os, I used to go out and watch him and learn. And yeah, I was very obsessed with it from a young age. And all the time I was at school, I didn't want to be a football player, rugby player or anything like that. I just wanted to be a tree surgeon and that's what I wanted to do. So it's yeah, it's it's been a real lifelong passion for myself. Where was it that you were seeing these trees and your dad was working on them? So I grew up down in Hampshire. So it's all around Hampshire where um, I grew up. But even, you know, we've always had dogs as a family. So we used to go out on lots and lots, lots of dog walks and things like that. And Dad would show us stuff. And, you know, I can remember by the time I went to Sparshot College when I first studied, did National Certificate in Arboriculture, by that point, you know, I knew a lot of tree species. I can remember one of our tutors, Ian Coolin, he was walking us around the campus. He goes, I bet none of you know what this tree is. And I was like, oh, I do. He goes, no, nah, you've never seen this tree. And it was a Genko. And I knew it straight away. And he said, oh, have you known that? You know, so you know, I was very lucky. And da- you know, Dad used to encourage me to look at books and that when we used to try and find, we saw a tree that we didn't really understand what it was or didn't know what it was. You know, we had um, tree books at home and I would go back and look it up. And then I suppose that's where the curiosity really started. So moving on to climate modelling, and to some people, those words might bring up ideas of swimsuits or posing, but actually it's a different kind of trunks and shoots that yeah, you yeah. work with, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, it's a real complex subject. It's new, really, when we start looking at landscape trees and a mini tree. been used in ecology for many years, since the 1980s. So when we look at climate modelling now, we use uh, future scenarios. So there's lots of data released um, through something called BiClims, so World BiClims, which is a big data set that uses multiple weather stations. And what they do is they take that data globally and then they look at the projections and they release these data sets into raster farms and then we use them to then start building future models. So that's what I work in. But what we do then is we then blend it i suppose would be the best way to describe it with um, species observation data so like the tree behind you there someone would have seen that tree out in the wild and put a gps point on it and that goes down into an observation and they're loaded up to a big global data set so then we can look at all the observations of all those trees and what we do then we mix them up with the climate data and then we can look at each square, each kilometre square where we know a tree's been observed and look at that climate. And what we do is we then look at future climate for the area that we're looking at. So for me, it's Kew Gardens. So I can look into the future under different model scenarios and look at what Kew's climate will be in 100 years' time. And from that, we can then match that to all the observations of all different tree species and then we can start to identify ecosystems we need to go to visit and understand it and look at the species that grow there and how they adapt to live in the future Kew Gardens and then we can also do the negative side of the job and that's looking at what trees are going to struggle and then we can use the same techniques and we go well this species from the ecosystem where we've collected it from, it's going to really struggle in the future. And that's what we're doing, to try to gather more understanding on basically selecting the right tree for the right place. It's just going that next level and using data to do that. So, you know, for Q, Q's always had collections from China, Japan, Vietnam, and that makes up a broad range of our collections. Now, when you look at that in an ecosystem, it's 
very warm, so they can deal with temperature, but it's very wet, it's very moist, and they have a lot of humidity in the air, and that humidity that tree relies on to grow. So we know now, by doing lots of work and looking at Q's climate, we're not going to have that humidity. We're going to have the heat. Can't get away from that. You know, last week they've already said when the 1.5 degrees is rising, so we know we're getting warmer. Look at today, it's 15 degrees in February. So we know we're going to get warmer. But what we need to understand is the moisture element. And a lot of um, species distribution models don't use moisture, they just use temperature. So we know currently that Q has about 620 mil precipitation. And by the 2090s, it's going to be about 660. So it's not a lot. That's a very little increase in precipitation. But what we do get an increase in is temperature. So the temperature, the mean annual temperature for uh, Q especially is going to be 14.8 by 2090. We're currently at 10. So that's a four degree rise. So what we'll then we have to understand is how that water reacts with the whole landscape. So the assessment we now do is we look at how much water comes in and how much we spend. So how much evaporates from the landscape. And then from that, we can then build into these models. So unfortunately for us, we know that certain areas of Japan, China and Vietnam, we won't be able to grow because our air is so dry, the trees go into drought stress. And that's because water always moves from positive to a negative and it dries out. And then the trees pump to try and replace that water, but there's no water in the soil because we're on sand and free draining. And because of that, they then go into drought stress. So in order to create a sustainable landscape to go forward, we've now started to select new ecosystems to go to investigate, which are going to be more matched to Q's future climatic conditions stroke ecosystem. So to give you an idea, at the moment we're moist temperate, and then by 2090, we go to semi-arid. And that's a big shift in ecosystem. And that's what we're trying to understand. And that's particularly pronounced, isn't it, in a heat island like um, west of London where Kew's based. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So that's what makes Kew such a fascinating place to manage trees. One, it's a really naff place to have a botanic garden. Right, we're on floodplain. So we're on our soil type is sand over gravel. So we have a high leaching point. We lose a lot of water through the soil. Can't hold it. And that's what creates this issue when we look at drought stress. And then you've got where it is. So it's surrounded in an urban environment. So you get a lot of heat all day. And often you will see Q because we have a Met Office station, Q is often the hottest place in the UK. And that's because what happens is it gets really hot. We've got such shallow soils. Our grass gets baked off very early the grass dies very early on in the season and because we lose that grass what then happens with the dead grass and that soil it gets really compacted from the visitors it then absorbs heat now it absorbs heat all day then radiates it at night and that really pushes the temperatures up and that's why Q is so interested in looking at trees because it is the perfect thing to look at heat islands and urban trees because of its setting and shallow soils. That's why we're so warm and dry. And that's what makes it a challenge, but interesting at the same time to try and grow and manage trees in that situation. Yeah, the other extraordinary factor is that you've got trees from all over the world. So scrolling back in time a bit, let's have a little think about why and how those plants were brought into that landscape. And can you tell us a bit about the plant hunters from the Victorian times and perhaps what were their objectives and how might they be different nowadays? Yeah, so that's why Q is one of the most amazing. I always think of Q as a living library. Rather than just an arboretum, it's a living library. Like you rightly say, we've got plants from all over the world, mainly from Asia. And that was all part from when William Hooker started the Arboretum. So William Hooker, when he became director of the gardens, he built his herbarium first. But then as time went on, he then started taking... So Kew is made up of three different estates. And it's all been joined. They're all royal estates, but they've all been joined together. Now we're getting up to the 18, 1840s 
William Hooker knows that William Ayton is going to retire, so he then wants to take the land on that he was managing. So he creates the Arboretum, and this was going to be the National Arboretum. That's what his vision was. And what they did, they then, with the new installed palm house, they then create the three vistas, which leads you round. Then he started laying out the Arboretum as on his taxonomic um, classification, which is the Bethna Hooker system. So Q is led out taxonomically, and that's how it's led out, which is great if you're in a herbarium. Not so much now because of pest and disease and trying to manage it, it's really difficult because you've got all groups of plants in together. So you've got all the Fagaceae together, for instance. So, and all Rosaceae over there. So if you've got a pest and disease coming, it's going to, it goes around really quick. But on that side, you can see why they did it at that time. And that was the thinking. So then you had lots of interesting plant hunters go out. The biggest one that's really for trees was uh, Henry Ernest Wilson, known as the Chinese Wilson. He did a, multiple trips to China. A lot of the plants that we all buy, all the woody shrubs that we all buy in nurseries today, a lot of them come from his first introductions. When he was working for Veach, he was originally a Q employee. Um, Veach were then after a someone to go out collecting for him and uh, Wilson was put forward so Wilson went on to go and collect lots of plants so a lot of the plants that we now have as big mature trees have come from Wilson and you know that really started to shape our landscape but Q's main goal then was to go and find the weird and wonderful how I try to think of it, it's a bit like stamp collecting. They wanted the rarest ones, and the ones no one else has got. You've got to remember, this is the Victorian era, and it's all about innovation and celebrating wealth and look what we've got, and that's what it was. You know, they were like, yeah, look what we've collected and look what we're growing in our landscape. And you had people like William Jackson Bean, who was there recording everything. So, he, you know, we all know Trees and Shrubs of the British Isles, one of the biggest references for dendrology. You know, he was writing that up and he was the curator at the Arboretum back then. So, you know, he was recording it as it come in. And then you had people that were working alongside him to do everything. And they were recording everything. And that's why Q was such a big hub back then. There was so much material. Coming in, and yet they were all writing how to manage it as it went forward. And they're really important pieces of text even today. You know, we refer back to them quite a lot when we're trying to understand why a tree might be in a certain place or why the landscape looks as it does. These writings that Bean did were, you know, really important and they still are. And he had survey books. He had tree survey books where he walked around and recorded everything. So, you know, for us in our archives, we're very fortunate to have things like that. So that's how we try to understand and piece together what these plant collectors did. But that's shaped the whole horticultural industry. You've got to remember, a lot of this went into the trade eventually. And a lot of the plants we all buy today, we all forget they all come from plant hunting originally. And most of the plants we have in our gardens today are Chinese and Japanese plants. You know, and they're very popular. What kind of common names can you put to those? Ah, so you've got things like the Japanese maple for instance, the, all the camellias, the rhododendrons, you know, there's a lot, all the, most of the aces that have come through there, you know, there's lots of them. And that's what they brought to us and they brought colour. Because if we were just to plant English natives, it'd be pretty boring. Everything would be a dull green. There's not many flowers about, isn't it? So, like, if you, I've been very fortunate. I've been plant collecting in Japan and, you know, I've seen it with my own eyes and you see it and it's an amazing world you're like wow and like you know native trees of uk and ireland you can probably get in a small little book but when you go into places like japan you've got multiple volumes and you know and they're massive bits of text and you're like we were there trying to identify plants you're like what really and that's you know we were just there for conifers you know let alone collecting other things so that's what makes it so interesting when you look at places like you but that's why they're so important now more than ever as climate change accelerates we all need to understand how trees fit within that landscape 
and our changing landscape and having places like Kew, Westonburg, Bedgebury, they're massive reference libraries to understand how things are going to grow and how they're going to react because they've been there and they've come in from a different ecosystem. And that's what's so interesting when we look at plant collectors and the influence that they had on our palette. You know, they, they affected our palette in our gardens, you know, even today. So, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting thing to look at. It's like a living experiment. And what you're talking about is actually thinking about curating, arranging these plants rather than all the ones from the same genus from across the world in one patch of the garden actually looking at where these plants grow originally and trying to construct and bring in something that is more sympathetic to their climate microclimate needs but also yes yeah, surrounding habitat needs as well and that's very different to the bragging kind of objectives of the original plant hunters but i think that's amazing how there's still parallels and i know you've been to different parts of the world as well and i'd like you to maybe take our listeners to a couple of the places you've been to visit particular trees so yeah what will the sites sound like in those places and yeah it takes on a bit of a journey kev yeah, it's, oh, I'm very fortunate. Yeah, I've been to some interesting places. So probably one of the best ones to start with is Japan. When I first went to Japan, when I'm my first collecting trip, and uh, there is, you know, you're there, you're in the mountains, high up. So we were collecting above 800 meters between eight, 800 and 2,000 meters. We were collecting, and then in Japan, you're in very dense conifer forests, right in ravines, and you can hear the river and the running down, and it's very, very humid and very hot. And it, you get up in the mountains, it's a bit cooler. You can deal with it. You know, it's a nice temperature, but you can still feel that humidity, and it's really interesting. I don't think you can truly understand the effects of what happens with your climatic conditions until you go and see it in the flesh as it were but going to, to japan was an incredible experience especially i always remember on our first day actually collecting we went and collected scardopities verticulata the japanese umbrella pine, and to go and see that was incredible you know that grows south facing volcanic rock very niche it's the last tree line before it goes to alpine so we were right above and it's in the cloud forest so it's always quite cloudy out there and it's quite cool on your face and quite moist all the time but it's an incredible experience and when you look back and i showed the kids some photos of when i've been there you know it brings it back to you and like talking about it now it was the most amazing experience to go there and you had big eagles flying over your head and stuff and it just the most amazing thing to go and do and so that's you know you're really warm and moist climate and then we bring them back to Kew because we were actually there as part of what was called iconic project back then run by Royal Botanic Gardens Edinburgh to collect all the rare conifers for conservation and that's why I went part as that as a climber to climb and collect the seed and you know some of the trees now at Kew we collected other things like magnolia oviata uh suga suga japonica which actually is doing really well at Kew which you wouldn't think it would because of it the moist but when you think back to where we collected it's grown on bare rock so it's free draining soil so of course it's going to do well because it's used to not having his feet in water not in, you know it's used to a very dry environment it's grown really well last year it come into cone i actually had two cones up here which is amazing to see you know looking at these cones that you remember collecting in japan you're now seeing them grow on the trees that you collected back in 2013 10 years ago so it's amazing to see that but then, you know, you then see your uh, Scardopteus verticulata, and they still haven't grown since we take them out of the air pots. They're still only about a foot high because you think it's a really fussy plant. How can you imitate that ecosystem when it's, you know, grows at 800 metres south facing on volcanic rock? <laughs> you can't re replicate that in a garden. So that's why they don't grow as well. But really interesting to go and see them. What's that one called? So that's the Japanese umbrella pine. Okay. But what was really frightening I found in Japan, as much as they've got a massive diversity of plants, was the state of their forests. And that will always stay with me because there's an invasive bamboo, which comes from China. It's very small. It's like light long grass. It's called sasa. 
And what that happens there, when the tree dies and there's a lot of um, light gets to the forest floor, instead of succession to the next tree, the next generation of trees getting light, the sasa moves in. So there's whole hillsides that you will see dead trees sticking up and just green sass around it. It's actually quite eerie to see because all over the map, it looks like a forest fire has been through, if you could imagine that. There's no greenery on the trees. They're just skeletons of what they were. And then you've got this green sasser that moves in underneath. And that was quite scary to see. And you, For a country like Japan, you wouldn't expect to see that. And that stuck with me. But also there, they have a big deer problem. It's a bit like the UK, to be fair. But in Japan... They don't cull them. Their sin is a sacred creature. So the deer there, they don't eat the sasa, unfortunately, but they graze and they, they do a lot of ring barking of the trees. So that's actually increasing the acceleration of the mortality in those woodlands. When you're there, they do some mad things. So they're wrapping wire around trees to try and stop chicken wire, essentially, mm. to stop the deer from nibbling at them. And it's, yeah, really weird. Whereas in... You know, the best way would be just to do a big fence around the whole sure. reserve. Yeah. But they don't do that. And, yeah, that was interesting. So that was there. I've been to the British Virgin Islands. But unfortunately for me, I didn't get to see it in all its glory and its temperate, well, its semi-rainforest there because it had been hit by a hurricane. So when we landed, it was very stark. That will stay with me for a long time, turning up somewhere where they've had a 210-mile-an-hour wind that's gone from one end of the island and then come back the other way. And the devastation that it caused not only to the, the landscape and the flora and fauna and everything, but to the people as well. You know, we turned up, there still wasn't running water and things like that. And we were there to try to help them get back on their feet. And we did a lot of restoration in their small botanic garden and at the governor's house, which they use, well, which was basically tourist attractions. And uh, that was really interesting to go see also how their whole ecosystem had been adapted by imported trees so you know a lot of it was the the mahoganies both the small leaf and the large leaf mahoganies were planted all in there on their mountains there but then they hybridize and you get the hybrid mahogany but seeing how they grew but the devastation and when a hurricane goes through and they're not from that environment and it just completely destroyed the whole mountainside and uh that was really scary to go and see what really happens and they had lots of epiphytes that were growing in those trees like the ecosystem had adjusted and um to see that all destroyed there's lots of areas of woodland that would be kept damp all the time because of canopy and humidity but because of the hurricane it stripped it all out and it all baked it dry you had soil that had never seen sun would then bait it's been baked off and really dry so that was really interesting to go see and all that planting with the mahoganies was from rockefeller so they influenced the whole ecosystem by planting these mahoganies which are you know really interesting and then you have the other side of it with the tourist board in the british virgin islands obsessed with because it's in the caribbean the caribbean look and they're obsessed with planting palms but palms don't grow there you know, they're not a native, but they're obsessed with these beaches with palms. And it's a really odd thing when you're talking to governors and policy makers, of, you know, of that country trying to say, look, why are you planting? You know, you need to be planting like big shade trees like the Tababuas. Because when you watch the locals, they're all under the shade trees because it's really warm and humid, like 90% humidity. So that was really interesting to go to observe. But then recently... I've been out in Romania, and we went out to West Romania there, went all through the, on the steppe, on the steppe forest. Now, I suppose for me, that was the most interesting trip that I've been on, and probably the one I will enjoyed the most, because one, it was led by my research to identify that ecosystem to observe, because that's where London, Southwest London's moving to, and to go to see what that actually looks like. And how they link together is incredible. So when we landed, it was very warm, 35 plus. This is in September. And you're going out on that step for it. And it exactly felt how Q does in the summer. And it, that was really stark quite quickly. So all the grass has died off. And you could feel the heat coming out the ground. 
and all the trees are looking very tired. They had literally had enough of summer. And that's exactly how Q feels come July, August, when we've had a heat wave and a drought. And that was really quite frightening to actually go, go, wow, this does feel like what Q does in the summer. And then you start to realise how well we can do stuff when we look at data. But to go and see the trees there was incredible. You're walking through these forests and um, it's as if they've been planted, but they're not. You're looking at trees growing on the very edge of their range. So we're looking at trees in such difficult conditions. After this tree line, it goes to plain and it's just grass and small shrubs. And to see trees there, I was amazed. It's literally like a forester's block planted it. So we were walking up hillside and to start with, it'd be like things like Acer tacaricum and Acer campestri, the field maple growing in this like literally like scrub small trees and then as you went up you had a few uh hornbeams that were there they grow completely different to what we see in the uk they're quite small trees where they're growing within their means and then as you would walk up the hillside we then went into tiliotormatosa silver line which is a native there and it's just loads of it's just tiliotormatosa nothing else and as you walk up onto the crest of the hill it just stops it's like why they just stopped there? It's really odd to see. But then it went into the Hungarian oak. So to see that from silver line to Hungarian oak, it's as if someone's going, oh, I would stop planting it now and plant the next species. But it was really interesting to see because that is just the species going 10 metres that way is too dry. I can't grow there. I've got to grow within my means. I just can't grow there whatsoever. So I'm going to stay here where it's comfortable or as much as it can be. And then we saw it again with beach. You know, we found a very small population of beach. It's a hybrid beach between the Oriental beach and the common beach. It's uh, Fagus cross taricum. That there, to see beach trees growing in an ecosystem where they get 40 degrees heat in the summer and they get 500 mil precipitation, it's, you just wouldn't see, you just wouldn't think they could grow there. And they're grown in an isolated pocket and it's a nature reserve. And it's uh, highly regarded by the European Union. They have people drive around to make sure that no one's damaging it. And literally, in the bottom of a little bit of a hill was all this beach. Really tall trees. They would have been, I don't know, 30 metres tall. So they're, you know, they're really big trees. And then literally, you have a little gravel track, a little track. And then they stop. And then it just went into Tilia Tormatosa again. And that's because the beach is going, ah, it's too dry that side of the road, I'm going to stay over here. And that's when you know you're seeing trees on the very edge of their range. And that's why it's so important to go and visit these ecosystems, to start trying to get an understanding of how trees adapt to grow within their means. Because that's the genetic memory we're going to have to start to incorporate into trees for the UK. Because we're not going to have the climate that we once had where we could grow the Asian species we shift into a semi-arid. So we need to start now to understand how those trees have adapted to grow there and why. And that's what the work that's really interesting now. I think that is the new thing for plant hunters. It's not about going and finding the rarest species. It's about going to ecosystems that are going to be our future ecosystems and understand how it all interacts and how we need to start selecting those trees and the genetic memory they have to grow in those environments and i think that's what's important now and understanding genetic diversity as well and the importance of it and not just keep planting the same clones like we do now for because it's got pretty flower or it's got an interesting bark we need to start selecting trees that are going to grow in that ecosystem and not just because we think they're pretty i think that's the biggest shift we have to make so interesting listening to you and so many themes came up there for me and things that I've spoken to other people about in the climate context. So I'm hearing that you're thinking local, what's happening at Q, what's right for there, but you're also taking a global mindset as well and thinking further back in time about where these plants originated from and then projecting forward to try and understand how we can set up to um, keep them going in the future or what might need to come in. A few quick questions though one would be why have you chosen 2090 as a reference point for the future 
And the second one would be perhaps linked to that. How are you observing what's actually happening at Q at the moment and sort of reconciling that future and present together in management decisions? Yeah, yeah. So the reason why 2090 is because that's as far as the climate modelling is going. So we're very, you know, I'm very restricted on the climate models. So they give the predictions out, uh, they're released on global data sets, and that goes to 2090 at the moment. And I think that's probably because that's as accurate as they can get it, and because of the, because it's all, yeah, it's just as accurate as they can get it at the moment without going too technical and everyone falls to sleep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so for me, what I really find interesting is using Q, the trees that we know come from our future ecosystem let's say or our climate conditions are the trees that are doing the best so it's really interesting to observe so the biggest tree at Qvar volume is the um, chestnut leafed oak Quercus castanifolia now that tree is 40 meters tall now and it's got canopy spread of about 38 39 that's a big tree and this what got me into this whole research was that was my favorite tree at Q. loved climbing it i was a tree surgeon that's what i wanted to climb the biggest tree and i wanted to understand why that tree was the biggest why it doesn't make why that in particular tree and then that's when i started to understand the ecosystem so that tree comes from the hurricane forest from iran runs into azerbaijan now listened to lots of talks and done a lot of reading on the area and that is sand again it's sand but it's in a rain shadow now that makes sense now why that tree's growing so well at Kew because Kew has very little rain and it's on sand and that tree's just thriving in it going yeah this is a little bit more comfortable in my native my natural ecosystem Oh, I can live here and it's grown real fast. But then you look at other species that occur with it. So you've got Parotia persica. So you've got the Persian ironwood. Then you've got Salcova carpinifolia, the Corsican elm. And then you've got things like Tilia dilostyla, the Crimea lime. They all grow in that ecosystem. Yet at Kew, they're our best trees. And what I learned the most was the heat wave and the drought of 2022. Those trees I just listed off were sat there going, yeah, bring it on this is easy now i can deal with this and they were still green they're still functioning still working yet you look at other trees especially our natives they're going oh my god i can't cope oh and that's what's really interesting and that's why i love looking at the trees at q because you can learn so much just through observation and that's why i love going to see these trees in their native environment because then you truly understand going to romania and seeing like acer campestri growing in the steppe you can understand why it does so well like when you've got we've because of q and we've got collections from various different ecosystems we have some from the original collections that are from that step environment and they've always done well and that's what was really intriguing to me was why does that tree do really well and that's an acid campus tree and that's doing really well it's not really drought stress it's dealing with the heat fine but that one over there is looking really ill why and then you read in it that one could come from ireland you know where it's grown in with cooler conditions moist you know it's always moist over its roots and that's what's really interesting and that's what i've i think i've learned the most and when we select trees like the prime example is probably the easiest that everyone thinks of is japanese maples right we all love them like, even i do and like they're pretty beautiful different colors we see them in the nursery they're in the pot and they're looking nice you know, yeah that looked great in the garden go and stick it out in the lawn and then we wonder why it dies it's like well, because when you see it in the wild, it's an understory tree growing in dappled shade, high humidity and high moist soils. We go and plant it in a garden in London, which is really dry. With a hose pipe ban. Yeah, with a hose yeah. pipe ban, you can't walk the poor thing. We just sit there and watch it wither and die. So th that's what my, that's what I find really interesting is understanding how these trees all adapt mm. to live in different ecosystems. And, you know, you, you think about it, lime, for instance, you got large leaf line and small leaf line that grows from Ireland all the way to Iran, and that's one species. How does it do? It? It's like English oak, right? We all call it English oak because we're all patriotic and we live on an island, but it's actually common oak of Europe. I did some work on that recently, and this is how 
we have to shift our mindset. Currently, English oak, when we look at it in its climatic conditions, London today, especially Q, sits right in the middle. Okay, so the climatic conditions it can live with. By 2090, we move to the very edge of it. Now, through doing lots of research and statistics and all the boring stuff that I do for modelling, if we want to see English oak grow successfully at Q, we need to go and get it from Iran, which is its last point it grows before it, it just doesn't exist anymore. And you think, how mad's that? Like, that's how much shifting we're having. And we've got to, like, we're getting this understanding now. And that's why I think plant collecting for the future is about seed provenance and the ecosystems that we're collecting it from for the future resilience. And modelling just helps us speed that up rather than guessing. And I, I think that's what my passion is now mm. as I look into it rather than just climbing trees now it's understanding how and why they grow in certain ecosystem yeah climate and habitat loss they can be big things to get your head around but actually trees can help bring a physical kind of language about what's going on in the world mm. and thinking back to that time Kev when you know you were watching your dad at three or, or whatever age you were mm. and Fast forward into what you're doing now. It is a kind of a world away from that, right? And I see you as a guy on a mission to save the world, right? <laughs> Building a supercomputer to help do that. And yet at the same time, yeah, you know, for your family, what do they think about this all? Yeah, and like, do you know what? I've been like, it's really strange. We're talking, I'm talking about it because it was Valentine's Day yesterday. Not that I'm sentimental like that, but me and my wife have been together 20 years been married for 11 but been together for 20 and we were talking about this yesterday so my wife i met my wife at college when i was trained to be a tree surgeon and she often turns around and says, <laughs> she says i can't believe the difference to what you do now to where you started like uh, growing up i just want to climb trees you know i want to climb the biggest tree i wanted to do everything you know work with cranes work with chippers loaders everything it's all about the job Big rigging. I loved rigging. That was the one passion as I had as a climber is give me the most difficult tree to take down just so I could work out the rigging. And, you know, it's how you evolve as a person to what I do now. My mum and dad find it difficult to understand the shift because I've gone from very practical doing it, like really enjoying that to like an academic level. And, yeah, but it is also a strength and it's a superpower because... Because I've made the transition from a very practical individual into academia, I look at things very differently to academics. They look at data. I deal with a lot, believe it or not, I never thought I'd be saying this, I deal with a lot of data scientists. And I'm there going, that's fine on the paper, but that doesn't, doesn't happen in real life. And I'm like, how do you know? So I've, so this is what I've done before. And I think that transition has made it really interesting. But yeah, for my family, yeah, they find it amazing, the transition to where I've moved to and where i've come from because they're two different worlds but yet they perfectly align and i think that's what makes it so interesting now because sometimes some of the things you look at like no that just doesn't make sense and then that allows me to go back and look at something or i can or on the other hand i can look at something yeah that makes sense because i've been in round trees all my life like yeah i can see why that works uh, yeah i think that's why it's so important sometimes that you do have people that work all the way literally from the rake up i started on the rake as a 16 year old and i'm now sat at the head of a tree collection never had an ambition to do it pretty accidental my career really <laughs> you know i just wanted to climb trees never expected to do what i do now yeah, but that gives you some really useful questions in that research context. I've got one for you, though. So in terms of trees in an urban environment and in London, is there anything management-wise that really gets your goat? You know, you wish that we did better. <laughs> Where do I start? Yeah, no, a lot of it goes down to species selection. Why do we still plant things like silver birch in an urban environment? Um, and a lot of the management, yeah, is it's... You know, we spend vast amount of money on planting trees, okay? We plant them. We think we're great. Everyone feels good. Everyone who's planted a tree, I don't care what, who they are and where they come from, you always feel great once you plant the tree. 
But no one looks after it. Right? We literally just stick it in the ground and then we just leave it to its own devices. You know, th- those trees need really intensive care for the first seven years, really, till they're established. And I think if we could just get that a little bit more right in an urban context and just think about it a bit more, we will be getting some really good answers. You know, it's, it's down to selecting the right species, but once it's in the ground, look after it till it establishes. Don't just leave it to fend for itself because it can't. It hasn't established its roots. It needs a big root system. It needs to get into that soil and get all the available water and nutrients that it has in that area. And, you know, if we're planting high water demand in trees in an urban landscape and then walk away and don't even think about watering it again, that's the issue we have and that's a real big issue in, in urban environments i think if we can just get more tuned in about getting trees established and not just about planting them we'll be on the way to something like the victorians created and you know when we look at species selection we need to start planting big shade trees and we're just not doing that and it's a great shame you only got to walk out of this building it's all london plains what, what happens when they go what's the next london plain there isn't you know no one's thinking that far ahead and planting and i do think we need to have longer term vision and not just think of landscapes especially urban landscapes in our lifetime that's the problem we have we just look at it in our lifetime and i think we need to have a more of a victorian mindset where they were doing it for the future and i, I think that's that's what really needs to happen i've just been looking at my questions and i think you've pretty much covered every base here (laughs) um i do have one last one for you and kev just a big thanks oh that's very kind (laughs) i'm I'm always buzzing after i'm speaking to you and yeah how you bring this to life and again just so glad that someone's on on that mission to uh to make sure we get these decisions right and and share that learning as well and i really want to stay close to your work as we go into the future but My last question is, what would be your final message for our listeners when it comes to trees? Oh, that's a final message. Take time to observe and wonder about what they're doing, I think would be my message. Just think, just stand by a tree and just think for five minutes what is going on and how the hell is that surviving in a difficult environment, especially in parks, and we all use and abuse them. And just just spend a couple of minutes thinking about, wow, how is that organism growing there? That would be my, yeah, my message, I think. You've been listening to the Meaning of Trees podcast forget to like, share and subscribe. See you next time.